Hi, uh, everybody. I want to, first of all, um, thank you all for, for joining this, this wonderful event um, and this great conversation. Uh, I want to let our attendees and participants know uh, that you can submit uh, any questions that you have uh, in the chat feature. Um, I am Robbie Lopez Irizarry. I am a rising junior uh, at NYU, and I'm a part of the Redemus uh, internship program, and I am currently interning remotely uh, with Voto Latino. And hey, everybody. Um, my name is Kathy Lee, and I'm also a rising junior at NYU, um, and I'm also with the Broadmouth Center this summer, and I'm interning with the Kluge Center at the Library of Congress remotely. Yeah, and I'd like to introduce some of our panelists. Uh, we have uh, Joe Abner from Congressman uh, Stephen uh, Shabbat's office. Uh, we have Rick Atkins from Congressman Jeff Duncan's office. We have Rick Jakius from Congressman Seth Moulton's office. Uh, Kathy Mahan from Congressman Jim Costa's office. Chris Miller from Congressman John Rutherford's office. And Megan Sims from Congressman Andre Carson's office. Um, Kathy, let's take it away with the first question. Great, sorry about that. Um, so I guess I'll just start off with some questions about you know, what a typical day for all of you looks like. I'm sure a lot of our um, participants might not be as familiar with how a congressional office really works and how a congressional staff you know, goes about its day-to-day -day operations. So um, let's start off with Megan. Could you just tell us a bit about you know, what you do in your job and some of your main responsibilities? Yeah, the, the mute feature is a little, there we go. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. Sure, so uh, a congressional office is made up of a team uh, of, personally, our office, I think we have eight in our Washington office and eight in our district office. And the district office is primarily responsible for uh, casework, which when people that live in our district um, have an issue with the federal government, whether it be the VA, Social Security, immigration, a uh, variety of things. Um, we have a team of folks that are there to help. So I oversee that team. Um, and, and in Congressman Carson's office, we have a great uh, working relationship with our DC. We also meet with constituents when he's in Washington or, or even here um, and work to uh, hear what priorities they have legislatively and help communicate that to our Washington office. Um, so that's a, a very brief overview. Great. Um, could we hear a little bit more from um, Chris Miller? Would you be able to tell us a bit about, you know, how you go about your day-to-day -day operations um, as a district director for Congressman John Rutherford? Yeah, I think um, Megan did a great job of covering the the basics, you know, of what we do. I, I think one of the things we also try to focus on is what we call our outreach program. And when the congressman can't be here, our approach has been that I go out as much as I can. And I know obviously in our current situation, that's made it more difficult to do that. And so we've had to shift how we're doing things virtually uh, for the most part. Uh, but in our normal day-to-day -day work, when things are, um, you know, as they were pre-COVID-19, I'm out of the office more than I'm in the office. Forming those relationships with all the different various leaders in our district, getting to know what's going on, what their concerns are, and really getting plugged in with our district at every level so that we're available. When the congressman can't be here, um, I like to say I'm his eyes, ears, and voice. And I try to make sure they know we're always accessible. And, um, and that's, a, that's a lot of what my personal focus is um, in addition to what, what Megan said about overseeing the office and, and leading the office in the casework uh, that we do. So that's just a, a little bit, little bit more about what we do, and um, yeah, I, I mean, it's to me, it's all, it's all about service. I guess that's how I'd wrap it up. Um, and the congressman sets the tone. 
and being a servant leader in, in our case is, is very important. I come from a background of service and so does um, our Congressman John Rutherford. Um, he spent 41 years in law enforcement in our community. And so this is just an extension of that service by serving in Congress and his staff here in the district. We uh, try to exemplify that, that uh, approach that he's, he's taken as well. Great, thank you. Um, and then just one final follow-up question for um, Rick Atkins. Um, how do you go about creating that, you know, bond with their constituents and how do you go about reaching those people in your district? Okay, all right, great. Um, well, in this new abnormal that we're in, um, it, it seems like most of the way that I'm doing constituent outreach um, is by calls like this. Um, I'm making calls every day. We have a list of 250 to 350, I'm, I'm not sure the number of constituents that have a large network or a large circle of influence. We call them, we make sure that everything's well there, nursing home administrators, hospital administrators. I'm on the phone with them a lot. Um, our first responders have been on the phone with them a lot. And, you know, in South Carolina, we're starting to open up again, and which is really, really good. Uh, I went to my first Rotary meeting on Tuesday, which was, was great. I've got another one this Tuesday coming up at another location. So, um, you know, that's how we're staying in contact with our constituents at this point. Things change uh, as, as we open up more and more. I'm starting to go to some of the small businesses that are open, some of that I've helped uh, guide through the PPP program and the idle loan programs and just to see how they're doing, make sure you know that they, they know the new rules that came out a couple weeks ago uh, with the PPP program and things like that. So it's been, it's been a, a learning experience, but it's also been a good experience and we're, we're learning how to navigate through some of the, the challenges. For sure, thank you guys. Um, Robbie, would you like to take it away with the next question? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so this is uh, for Kathy Mahan. Uh, you know, does congressional uh, gridlock affect your work? And if so, you know, how so? What does that look like? Um, oh, that's an interesting question. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I do think um, gridlock affects us in the district office. Um, I mean, a, a as um, everyone has said, a primary role that we have is, you know, communicating with our constituents and we meet with them, you know, pre-pandemic in person, now a, a lot of phone calls and, and different kinds of virtual meetings. But, um, and, you know, there's a lot of frustration from people who um, want, you know, to see problems addressed and solved. And, you know, I think we've probably all um, had pieces of legislation and things that we've worked really hard on um, that just get sort of stuck somewhere. Um, and, you know, so it, it's a difficult, um, it's difficult for people to understand, like, that we, we have a process that it has to go through and that process often takes a long time and and it takes compromise and, and that we try to work towards that. Um, um, and sometimes people get a little impatient with that. And um, so we, we have to, to kind of deal with that. But, but at the same time, I think it also makes us like look for other ways to approach things and to, to extend our outreach more to see if there's a different way that we can help people. Um, in the end, our goal is to always try to help people through whatever problem they're having or, or address them and make sure that we listen and people feel heard. So, um, you know, I, I do think we, we learn to manage that, but, but yes, I, I do think it affects us. Great. Um, same question to uh, Rick Dacius, you know, uh, does, yeah, how does congressional uh, gridlock affect your work? Um, and yeah, maybe if you can give us a sort of different perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I don't think it's any secret that um, Congress isn't always getting a lot done. I mean, you look at the number of bills passed um, 
Congress after Congress, and it's um, going down in record numbers. And so um, as a district director, I have to think a little differently about my job. I also first started with a member almost 20 years ago when we had congressional earmarks. We were able to direct money directly into our district. That doesn't exist anymore. And so we have to think really differently about how we do things. Um, and it may sound crazy to say this as a progressive Democrat, but I don't think government alone can solve um, the kind of deep-seated types of social problems we're trying to tackle. Um, but nor can the private sector or academia or nonprofits. And what has to happen is collaboration across all of those. And so I think we have been most effective as an office when we've partnered, convened, collaborated across the boundaries of what would be the quote unquote normal job responsibilities. And so just to give, I mean, guess two quick examples. I'm working right now, um, the city of Salem, Massachusetts is where I'm standing right now. I'm obviously famous for the Salem witch trials, depends a lot on tourism. Um, I'm working with a team from the Harvard Kennedy School in the city of Salem to look at how can we keep the small business community here afloat when they're going to lose the entirety of their busy summer and fall season. And, and, and how do we keep storefronts from going dark? Um, you know, we worked with the GE Foundation and the state of Massachusetts to create a workforce training program um, to train up the workforce that we are going to need in the advanced manufacturing sector with a focus on women and people of color um, directly related to a helicopter jet engine program that we helped secure jobs in our own district for um, through, through the House Armed Services Committee. And so we're most successful, frankly, when we think outside the box and don't just prescribe to the normal channels of how we're supposed to be doing things. Great. Um, so I guess now let's move more toward current events. Uh, Kathy? Great. Yeah. So you guys all, you know, briefly touched upon how your job has changed in a virtual setting. And what we're really interested in knowing more about is how the COVID-19 pandemic has really affected your job, um, specifically how that's affected, you know, your outreach to constituents, how that's affected your ability to meet with a lot of important interest groups and a lot of important, um, you know, members of the public that you would typically be able to meet with in a face-to-face -face basis. So um, we'd love to hear from all of you. Um, of course, if you have anything to say, jump in, but I will start off with um, Rick Adkins, if you would, you know, give a little bit of your perspective. Yeah, as I spoke about a little bit earlier, um, you know, we're doing a lot of telephone conversations, a lot of Zoom calls with our constituents, um, our outreach. We, we have two different teams in our in our district offices. We we split it up. The casework folks they they do nothing but casework, and our outreach team we do very little anything else but outreach, um, and we do bridge the gap between the constituent and our DC office. Our DC office has not returned back to work yet. I mean, they're still working from home. Uh, we've been back in our offices for four weeks. We are taking very very limited in-person meetings. Uh, but we are going out some as, as, as our staff feels comfortable. And um, I'm not requiring anybody to do anything they're not comfortable doing. So the telephone meetings and the Zoom meetings are still the prominent way that we're going out and, and meeting with constituents, talking with constituents. Um, social media has done a, made, made our lives totally different in the last 10 years because our phones don't ring, at least our office, they don't ring as much. We have a really strong social media pro uh, program. So people will Facebook message or Twitter or whatever they do uh, to our to the congressman or to us and and we handle things that way. So it's 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 different, of course, uh, but we're still out there doing, you know, the casework has not slowed down. And honestly, we've we've been able to uh, manage the casework really, really well. Great, yeah, um, I'm sure, you know, it, it's been challenging moving on to this online format. And to that end, I'm curious how the pandemic has really, you know, changed your way of evaluating need in your district. Um, for example, I'm sure the pandemic has really brought to light, you know, some of the more vulnerable populations in your district, specifically students who might rely on schools for, you know, food security or people who are, you know, immunocompromised or the elderly population. Um, so I'm wondering from both Chris or Megan, um, 
uh, let's start off with Megan, how that has kind of changed um, during this pandemic. You know, we knew, uh, you know, Congressman Carson and his, uh, and, you know, our office are acutely aware of the needs of our community. Uh, you know, I think that I credit the people in our office doing outreach and that we knew going into this, who would likely be most effective or affected by the pandemic. And so we were able to reach out quickly to those that, you know, um, restaurant and hospitality workers and get early on, get a town hall with the congressman with them and to see how this would affect them and to know and, and to provide outreach even virtually um, to those that would be hardest hit. And I really credit my boss for having those relationships in the community and knowing um, who is going to need help quickly. And so I think that, ha you know, we were able, we couldn't predict every scenario, but I think because we really have a pulse on the community and going into the COVID pandemic, we're able to have those existing re relationships. We were able to quickly move um, to an outreach structure. And I know that at least in our office, we've done more town halls maybe now than ever before. I mean, he did a lot before, but we're not having to drive across the district. And so that is a nice, you know, you can do back-to-back -back Zooms pretty quickly um, when it comes to outreach. So, you know, C C Congressman Carson has been big on, obviously, food security was a huge thing. Um, internet access, you know, a, a hot topic is bringing, you know, rural broadband, but it's not just rural broadband that's an issue. Indianapolis is an urban community. It's about access. And so some of those most vulnerable families don't have access to the internet. Um, and can't afford it. And so, you know, he's been a big proponent for that as well um, in helping to connect those communities early on um, in early March. So, you know, we've done a lot even with our state when it comes to unemployment and ensuring folks um, receive their benefits, which is an issue here in Indiana. So I really think that we um, were able to stay on top of it, but who knows what will happen from here as we keep going through this. Great, and I would just like to ask the same question to Chris, you know, how has the situation in Florida been impacted by the pandemic and how has this pandemic illuminated some of the challenges that specifically target your district? Chris, can you hear me? I think we might have lost Chris for a couple seconds there. Um, uh, then I'll, re I'll redirect this question to Kathy. Um, how has the situation changed in California and how have your, how have your districts um, you know, dealt with the challenges with the pandemic? Um, yeah, um, so we're in central California um, and it's um, kind of a cross between we have some uh, large cities and um, it's also a large agricultural and rural area. So we sort of have uh, multiple issues that, that we've um, ha um, have dealt with. Um, you know, I think Megan gave a kind of a, a good summary that I think I can echo a lot of, but um, I think when we first went into this um, and started, you know, realizing what was happening, you know, what I did with our district staff is we started putting together just lists of, of um, community groups and people that we just needed to reach out with that we thought might be affected. And we just started collecting information and 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 just trying to then you know one feed that information back to washington so that they had it while they were looking at legislation but but also so that we could you know immediately start trying to help direct people to the resources that we knew were available and um you know so i mean i think we've had some in, kind of interesting challenges i i think it's evolving every day and it, it you know it, it's like you got through one kind of thing and then the next couple days you start hearing about something else you know so early one of the things that we've dealt with here is we have um, a large um, Hmong population and many of them are um, are farmers and they're very small farmers and family oriented farmers and we also have very you know large big massive farmers you know here and a lot of the assistance programs help the bigger farmers but not the smaller farmers and so we've put a lot of time into trying to find different programs. You know, I reached out to our UC cooperative and we were, you know, trying to work with our community foundation to see if we could get, you know, and just think outside the box and see if there were grant programs or different things that we could do to help these mom farmers. So 
And, you know, we also talk about that legislatively, like, well, what do we need to do to change things so that maybe some of those people can get assistance and not be overlooked. So we, that's one example, but, you know, as that problem is being dealt with, you know, just yesterday, the Congressman was on the phone with a, a group of um, child care providers and they're really, I mean, I think this is one of the really next big issues that's that we're going to have to confront is with schools being um, operating very differently um, in California. They're talking about doing sta staggered days there. Um, you know, what's going to happen for parents who return to the workplace and what you know, if they have staggered days, how is that going to work? How is how is that going to affect all these child care providers? What are the rules going to be? I mean, it, it's it's just, you know, there's a lot of guidance and people have a lot of questions. And so I just give you those examples as like, that's kind of how it evolves. And, and as the different guidance and the different things start opening up, we're confronted sort of with new challenges and new things that people are reaching out to us for help with. And we just try to take them each one as they come. Great. Um, and I guess, you know, we, we lost you a little bit there, Chris. Um, just wondering if you have some insight to provide on how the pandemic has affected your job in Florida. Oh, thank you. I, I appreciate it. Sorry about that, Kathy and everyone. We have three uh, virtual sessions going on in our office at the same time at various levels. So, that's, that's an example of how that's affected how we're doing things and, and probably our system isn't set up to handle that. So we'll have to take a look at that as well. Um, but mostly, you know, I, I think I, I go back to something I think um, Megan said, we, we are at an advantage here in the district because Congressman Rutherford was a law enforcement officer for 41 years and he was on the streets all the time. And his approach was forming those relationships with all the community leaders and knowing that whole area as, as best he could. And so when he became Congressman right after uh, being term limited as sheriff, he just continued to draw on and build on those relationships he had already established as sheriff. And so that's helped us tremendously. And so we, we don't have as long of a learning curve um, and we've been able to interact quite a bit with those, those same leaders to help address whatever concerns come up, but also, as was mentioned earlier, what are legislative efforts that we can champion to help make those challenges um, for those parts of our community um, better? And, and if they're a problem here, more than likely they're a problem throughout our country. So how can we work in a bipartisan way uh, to be able to affect some of those positive changes that are that are needed, um, and and for example, we're we're going the day after tomorrow. We're three people from our office, including the congressman, will be participating in a farm share food distribution program here locally. And the cars drive up, they open their trunk, and we put the food and the drinks in, and they just keep on going. And you know, we're able to um, adhere to the the guidance the distancing guidance, but at the same time, make sure people are getting the food and, and the water that they need, um, as well as programs for the schools. That was mentioned, uh, food in a backpack. We have a local chapter here. Throughout the year, they make sure when those kids go home on a Friday, the ones who are having problems and their families aren't able to provide the food that they need to sustain them, they've now stepped up and private and, and public uh, partnerships have developed to help them now provide food through the week as well, not just for that one day on Friday that holds them through the weekend till they can get back to school and get a good meal. So those are some of the things that are, that are going on and we've just had to make some adjustments and help where we can, uh, as well as um, I do. I did want to mention also, it's not just about federal agency work, even though that's the casework we're responsible for helping constituents with. But if our office is to, to really care and really help people, we have to form relationships at the local and the state level with all the elected officials. And then when we're referring people for free legal aid. Uh, for immigration, for refugees, or 
uh, asylum seekers, or if we're helping referring for unemployment, which is a state function, we have to be involved in that process and help give them a warm handoff uh, to the people who can help them and not just say that's not a federal agency matter, so you'll have to go to someone else. So we really work hard at, uh, and I think that's why uh, Megan was saying she's busier than she's ever been, because I'm sure their office does the same as, as well as all of ours. Uh, and so it's, it, again, is really about selfless service and trying to really help, not just uh, with federal matters. Great, thank you. I'll, um, I'll turn it over to Robbie for um, the next question. Yeah, so moving on a little bit, this question will be posed uh, to, to Rick Jakius. Um, and, I, and I actually hope to hear from everybody on this. Uh, how is your office responding uh, to this crisis of uh, police brutality and racial injustice? How's that? Sorry. Um, it's been really challenging. Um, you know, up to this point for the last couple of months, um, you know, we've all been working from home um, and our member has been working from home and we had to think about how do we kind of navigate and engage on this? Um, how do we navigate and engage internally ourselves as kind of a, a staff group, but how do we also engage with our community? And so um, it began first and foremost with, with a lot of conversations internally. Um, those were driven rightfully so by, by the, 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 the members of color of our staff. Um, and we had a lot of conversations about kind of what was the, our appropriate role, what was our appropriate response. Um, and those are ongoing, you know, we have always kind of engaged in implicit bias training and some of the other things, but um, that are offered by the house. But, you know, even before this happened, we had been talking about, well, how do we get beyond kind of the surface level stuff and, and have some real conversations. Um, and we're, and we're lucky to have a team that, that's pretty tight um, and, and we're able to do that. Um, it's immensely challenging though, because it's obviously deeply personal um, to do this over video conference. Um, but I think we figured out how to do so. Um, and we've gotten Seth out to um, a couple of demonstrations now. Um, and we really kind of sat and um, as we do in kind of when, when a lot of difficult situations come up, talk about, okay, what can we do, legis what's happening legislatively? How do we get involved? You know, survey what's happening. What bills are we a part of? What bills should we be a part of? Take a look at what's happening in the community. How do we be involved? And then where are there gaps and holes and how might, might we play a role um, in leading on that? Um, and a lot of that focused on, you know, I work for a white male Caucasian member in a 92% Caucasian congressional district. What is our role in that situation? You know, sometimes leadership is knowing when and who to follow um, and not being out in the front. And so that's really been the path that we've taken first and foremost is to try and listen and learn from, from the leaders of color in our district and take their cue on, on how best to engage. And, and that's a process we're still figuring out. Yeah, and, and um, I, I'd also like to hear from uh, Rick Atkins on this. You know, how is your office responding to the crisis of racial injustice and police brutality? And if anyone wants to jump in and offer their perspective, please do so. Thanks. Um, kind of like Rick just said, we're in the process of listening and, and learning. Uh, we're a very rural district, probably larger uh, land wise than, than most of the panelists on here just because our largest county has right under 200,000 people. So we have 11 counties. It's very rural. Um, I'm, the, the Caucasian to non-Caucasian uh, makeup is probably 70-30 Caucasian to non-Caucasian. We haven't had any problems uh, uh, with law enforcement or with uh, demonstrators or anything. So it's been we've been very fortunate. Uh, we 100% support our law enforcement. It's it's sad that as a as a country and as a uh, I guess uh, as a society that we're we're blaming. Um, we're, we're we're it's hard it's hard to explain, but it, it's hard to for us to um, 
blame everyone for a few bad apples. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. 99.9% .9 of the law enforcement officers are great people who've done a great job. A few of them have not. And um, I hate to see that they all get painted with a broad brush. Um, but we've been very fortunate. We're, we're looking at the new bill that's coming out. Uh, we had some discussion on that today. We're gonna be meeting with uh, virtually with our 11 um, sheriffs in our, in our district over the next um, week or so to see what their thoughts are. And so it, it's, a new, it's a new process for us to, to go through this, as with probably most everyone on the panel. My, uh, so my boss uh, is a former law enforcement officer and is also a member of the Congressional Black Caucus. So um, I feel fortunate that, uh, you, you know, I've worked for him my entire time in my congressional career. So I feel fortunate that, you know, our office has him as a leader and can look to him in times like this. One of the um, police action shootings actually happened during COVID in Indianapolis. Um, prior to the movements you're seeing nationwide, we locally had protests for Drayshawn Reed, and uh, my boss was engaged early on with that, talking to the family, talking to the police officers, getting, you know, he, as a former law enforcement officer, he wants to look at every side, but also he'll actively say that he's been targeted. He was arrested at a mosque. He's also Muslim, so he was arrested at a, at a mosque at the age of 17. So he's experience this and live this and as a white woman personally i'm never going I, he, i'm going to lead from his example but he really does read, lead our office through this so uh, we've been having those conversations constantly as an office since he was elected um but especially during covid given what's happened in indianapolis and so when um protests happen in indianapolis um especially this black weekend he was very active in speaking out um on that and we as an office and he went and spoke so um and it was the largest that has gathered since the 60s in indianapolis on this issue and so he was very adamant in that he will be uh supporting the justice for policing act um but is also looking for other legislative answers that go even further. So it's something that he'll remain engaged on and we've been even Zooming and calling with local activists and activists across the country. But it's something that um, as an office we've been engaged on since he was elected. So it, it just seemed natural that it's been brought to light as a nation now because it's conversations that have happened in our office forever. So. Great and uh, this is to Chris, you know, what is the current protocol uh, for dealing with inquiries uh, received from constituents uh, regarding police brutality? Um, I'm not sure if I'd say we have a, a protocol per se, but I, but I can speak to the, um, the offices and organizations that, that are involved when, when something comes up like this. And again, um, given our congressman was was our sheriff as well before he still maintains those close relationships with the agencies um, such as the state attorney's office who provides the oversight and and if needed prosecution for the uh, Jacksonville Sheriff's Office um, and he's able to work with them talk with them as well as talk with the sheriff and as was said get all perspectives on it but also make sure that a light is is put on anything that is brought to our attention and and get it into their hands so that the the correct people can can address it and uh, so again I think he's he and we are in a unique position to be able to um, work very closely because those those relationships were established uh, before he became congressman uh, so I don't know if that directly answers your question but I I, I hope. Um, you know, I, I hit the mark somewhat. Great. Yeah, thanks. And uh, just Kathy, uh, you know, I'd love to hear your perspective uh, on this issue. You know, how is your office uh, responding to this crisis? Um, 
Well, I, I think um, like everyone else, I mean, I think we've had a lot of internal conversations. Um, what, I think that there are um, sort of two sides of it that, that we really um, are kind of looking at. One is just what's happening in our community and where can we, you know, be effective and active and, and, and really listen in our community so that, that we can take our cues from, you know, um, our constituents. And so, um, you know, we have had um, several protests here. The congressman did go out um, to, to one, um, and it was kind of an interesting um, one where it was um, really kind of the community on all sides coming together because there, there was sort of um, threats out there to, to create like extra violence and sort of everyone came together to kind of squash that down and, and, um, and kind of work together to, to keep our community um, um, safer um, and he participated in, in that process and um, you know and it was a good experience because um, there was just a lot of listening and collaboration going on between the police and the community members and the, the organizers who've been doing um, our local protests and, and I think that that was a good experience for us to be um, a part of. Um, we've um, also just been doing a lot of outreach to just all kinds of different from groups. We're, we're over three county area. So, um, you know, we're trying to make sure we have a very broad reach of, of um, trying to um, communicate with people. We have a very active group in our Fresno area of um, African-American pastors who are, are very um, strong leaders in our community. And um, we have uh, regular conversations with them, but um, we are doing that again to kind of you know, get guidance from them. Um, and they're very honest about what's happening in the, in the community with us. Um, and then we're also, there's a lot of legislation coming, a lot of different bills, and it's all happening very quickly. And um, we're really trying to assess it and get feedback on it and try to, you know, understand the meaning. And I, I think, you know, and just really understand all the terminology and what people mean by things um, so that we can have, um, thoughtful and um, very good conversations. We have a very diverse community. We do have some inequities in, in our larger cities, especially, well, and our rural communities that are just have access issues for a lot of things. We've been aware of those and like Megan, like those said, those are things that we've always been dealing with. So um, some of this we were already, I think, prepared for and, and kind of understood, but um, you know, and then in addition to that, we've been working, we have um, several universities in our district area. And so we are working with our universities to try and put together kind of a year long program going forward. There's been a, a, a pretty active group of people in our community who've been really diving into um, the racial inequities in our community. And we kind of want to work with them and build something with our universities to try and create um, I guess like listening sessions or some kind of programming through our universities that would be community-based going forward so that this conversation doesn't just stop right here and, and that we can build takeaways going forward. So that's something we're getting started on. So we're just, you know, trying to tackle it from a, a lot of different ways. Great, and now Kathy's gonna uh, switch gears a little bit. So next question. Great. Um, so thank you all for your insights. That was um, very, very illuminating and an important conversation to have. Um, so now we're going to switch a little bit into the audience Q&A portion. So um, I will be receiving some questions and then I'll pose them to you and then we'll just kind of go from there. So the first um, audience question we have from Angeline. So she asks, what has been your office's role in helping with unemployment issues? Um, I will pose that question first to um, Rick Jackius, if you would like to um, answer that question. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, so unemployment issues are traditionally the purview of state government, um, but most state government uh, officials, certainly in Massachusetts, don't have significant staff. Um, and so we found as this um, crisis hit that our state delegation um, was overwhelmed with the number of unemployment claims. And so 
I think as several people have mentioned, a significant portion of what we do is constituent casework, helping them navigate federal agencies. We quickly realized that some of that was gonna be put on hold just by the nature of agencies being shut down or issues changing, and some issues were gonna ramp up quickly and, and significantly. And so um, we redeployed two of our caseworkers to basically become overnight experts on unemployment claims and handle all of the overflow that was happening um, with our state offices. You know, we spend a lot of time and energy building good relationships with them, handing cases back and forth, depending on whether they were federal or state issues. Um, and so we had the infrastructure in place to do that and do it quickly. Um, but, you know, that is only really recently um, started you know, we sort of saw ebbs and flows, quite frankly. We saw a lot of people, uh, you know, it started with small businesses and then it became unemployment and then EIP checks. And then um, I don't want to bore people with the details, but a very, very small number of people in this country are getting these ridiculous debit cards instead of checks for the EIP and they have been nothing but headaches. And a big portion of them are coming out of the IRS um, facility in our district. So a lot of folks in our district are getting those. We're seeing a lot of that. So we had to really reinvent the, the, the very nature and the way in which we were doing casework. Great, thank you. Um, so a next question we have from Eric. Um, and this is something I would like to see a couple of your perspectives on. Um, so how does your role change during an election year, specifically this year? Um, I guess I'll throw that question first to Rick Atkins. Well, our office, we try to stay out of the political side of it and, and the campaign side of it. And, and from an ethics standpoint, we, we have to. Now, understand that people call our office all the time, and I'm sure my colleagues' offices as well, about you know uh, political stuff, and, and we have to transfer them to our campaign office. Um, but our role, and my role specifically, and my staff's role during a campaign year, we we roll just like we always do. Um, we try not to get involved with campaign. I know there was another question uh, that was asked, and, and about you know uh, from a standpoint of do we. Um, I forget how it was worded, but from an activist standpoint, it, yeah, people who work in our office have a political interest, uh, but we do align with our boss. If we don't align with our boss, then uh, we basically just keep it to ourselves. Who we vote for, how we vote is, is between us, but from our outward appearance and what we do and what we say and how we say it, we, we certainly don't go against what our boss uh, believes in and, and talks about. So. Our, my role doesn't change much at all, and, and, and my staff, our role does not change much at all, not during an election year or, or a non-election year. And, and, and my colleagues may be different, but, but that's the way we are. Great. Um, would, any, um, would any of you like to jump in on that, or um, I will, if not, I can move to the next question. Um, the next question is, you know, kind of related to what Rick, you were talking about. Um, this question is from another one of our audience members and they're asking, while the representative's positions do come first, how important is it for staffers to personally align with their members' platforms? And do you guys have rules about activism outside of work or about, you know, how you go about managing potential conflicting views? Um, I'll pose that question to Megan. Sure. So, uh, I, Congressman Carson in our office, we, he has really set a culture of he likes differing opinions and differing, differing views. So, he actually appreciates the back and forth. He likes to have, you know, we have a diverse staff in race, ethnicity, age, and he really, and backgrounds, he really likes to hear diverse, you know, really diverse opinions on every, uh, on all kinds of topics. Um, and, and takes that all into account on purpose. And so we don't have any official uh, rules against activism on the outside. I mean, it can't interfere with your, with your official duties and official duties in a congressional office are never just nine to five. We have outreach staff that goes out in the evenings. You know, you may be speaking actually at a, an event 
or a rally on behalf of Congressman Carson. If you so happen to align with it, great. If you don't, then, you know, that, that can be complicated. But we haven't run into that a lot. We do have very passionate people and, and, and on issues. And there have been times on certain policies, people do differ it, but we're, we do it in a respectful way. And um, Congressman really re respects if you have a differing viewpoint and, and appreciates it and tries to, you know, take that into consideration. But we really don't, you, you know, that's not a, an issue with our office. Um, yeah, Rick, uh, Rick Jay, would you like to add to that conversation? I would, yes. Um, you know, I, I um, we sort of, in terms of our official responsibilities, I really have kind of two rules with my team. The first is maximum input before a decision, maximum unity afterwards. Um, so we really try and get everyone's input um, as we're making a decision, especially for high stakes decisions, or especially if we have the time to do so. Like sometimes in the heat of the moment, we don't. Um, and the corollary to that is really is if, if, if a decision or stance of, of the congressman um, offends your basic morals or values, then you probably need to leave the team. Like this probably is not the right place for you if you cannot live with that decision. And so we disagree frequently, um, but we do so behind closed doors. And once a decision is made, we're all aligned. And if we can't align, then we're probably in the wrong place. Um, now, in terms of the personal time, um, I, I'd say I'm, I'm considerably more permissive of what, of what our staff does. You know, we had a member who wanted to run for city council. Um, he, you know, he had a, an outward facing role in the team. And, and I told him like, look, you, you, you either need to leave the team or we need to shift you into another role because your politics are not necessarily the same as the members. And you're not going to be the candidate you want to be and can be. And you're not going to be able to do your job if you are juggling whether you are out there wearing the hat as a city council candidate or as a representative of Congressman Seth Moulton. And so he shifted into a new role. He shifted into an inward facing casework role and he ran for city council. Um, and so I have certainly had to have some awkward conversations from time with community members and community leaders and elected officials who are like, hey, what's so-and-so doing? I'm like, look, this is their personal time. I respect their personal political opinions. It makes us stronger as a team that they bring those values. You know, those do not reflect who we are as an office or what our member believes in. Um, so, so we, you know, we, we kind of treat those two, whether they're kind of on the clock or off the clock very differently, but those, those are the philosophies we follow. Great. Um, I'll pass it over to Robbie actually to um, take on some of the next audience questions. Yeah, the next question comes from uh, Juan. Uh, has teleworking hindered or improved uh, between the district office, Washington DC office, uh, and the member? Uh, so this will be posed to, to Kathy. Um, I, yeah, I would say actually um, teleworking has um, really improved our relationships. Um, I think we're talking more than we've ever talked. Um, I think through um, having the, the, um, the virtual meetings um, and having video chats, like we've gotten a little glimpse into each other's lives and we've learned more about each other personally. Um, and I think we've had, um, longer conversations and and had to really work through problems like you know just instantaneously um that that maybe we were putting off before um and yeah so i i really feel um like it's helped i mean i do think that there are there are i'm not going to say that there were some technological issues the first few weeks that of trying to get everybody up to speed teleworking um, there were, you know, did people have different uh, skill levels with technology? So trying to tackle each one of those. But but what's been really um, great to see is like different team members jumping in and like just offering to help each other. And um, I I think that we've seen more of that than ever, and it's it's been really fantastic. Um, with the member, um, we're having um, really good staff conversations with him. Um, 
I think that sometimes we have some issues with scheduling just because there's so many, like all the meetings are like right on top of each other, back to back to back to back. And with the, the technology trying to, to teach him to use it um, when he doesn't have staff there as much to, to help him and to hand him information and folders so so that part i think is probably where there's been a little bit more challenge but between all of the offices um it's definitely improved great um and so our next question is from dana and it's uh, what skills uh do you look for when hiring entry-level staff uh this is uh for chris Thanks, Robbie. Um, I think uh, there are a number of things I personally look for, and um, I think it's important to, to be able to just assess what people's uh, people skills, to me, that, that's got to be one of the most important things, because if, if you can't interact well with constituents and, and make them feel comfortable to want to um, open up and share with you. Um, it's very hard to, to, to really assist them as we, we best can if you don't have those good people skills. I think also uh, good research and writing skills are very important. Um, is someone energetic? Are they very proactive? Do they want to do what they need to do? And as I said earlier, help connect them even when it is in our area to directly address to make sure that um, any things that they have are, are being taken care of. And I also think it's important um, that we just get a, a feel for how well that they're, they're able to work together. And I think when you bring them in and you let everyone uh, have some interaction time with them, that helps with with that to, to see how well they're gonna gel with the team. And um, so I think those are just a, a few of the things I'd offer. Great, and um, Kathy, I think uh, there's another question. So um, Kathy, why don't you take us with, uh, with the next one? Great, yeah, so this question is from Kevin. Um, and this is asking, how do you recommend that we tackle the challenge of reaching everyone in your district, even those who aren't really as civically engaged or politically engaged, um, including those who are a bit harder to reach, like sick populations, like elderly populations, or, you know, populations with limited mobility? Um, so I'll post that question first to Rick Atkins. Well, that, that's a tough question, uh, especially since everything's moving towards technology. And um, I, can, I can honestly say our office traffic, and we started in 2011, the people that actually come to our office unsolicited, where they just walk in, has dropped drastically. So even the folks that are probably a little technologically uh, suppressed, I guess, whether it be they don't have broadband or they're not very computer savvy, uh, are finding ways to get things to our office. We've got 6,000 square miles of, of constituents. So that's a pretty big area. We only have two offices. So you may be an hour, or an hour and a half away from one of our offices. So people have, been, have learned to be able to, to go to their library and scan and uh, email a privacy release form to us and things like that. So it's, it's hard to get to everyone. We have a, a list of probably 150 email addresses, 150,000, sorry, of our 700,000 constituents that we send out regularly, but emails change on a regular basis. So the open rates kind of, you know, low from what I understand, but it's, it, it's just hard. We don't. We don't actually have a, a, a TV market uh, in our district. It's it's in a different district. Uh, it's in it's in the fourth district, and we're in the third congressional district. We don't have a TV station, uh, so we're we're hitting different markets. It's it's odd as as rural as we are, um, but I think we do a pretty good job of. That's why I was saying earlier in in uh, when we were talking, 
you know, we have a list of people that have large circles of influence that we contact and then they get, they get the message out. We, we give out hundreds, if not thousands of business cards and say, tell people, if you know someone that has an issue, tell them to call me, tell them to call us, email us, whatever. So that's how we handle it. Great. Um, so the last question we have is from Scott and he's asking, what do you wish constituents knew about your job? Um, so I'll ask that question to Megan. Who, <laughs> what do I wish they knew? That we genuinely care. So that even, you know, we're not reflective of the political division that's happening in Washington, that we are in this to serve and truly our boots on the ground outreach, you know, we're here to help. We're not here to make, um, you know, any of our constituents' lives harder or not to feel like they're heard because that's something genuinely, um, in our office, we have a culture of like, we're here to serve. And so we're here to help you not, you know, it doesn't matter if you're on the far right or the far left, like, like in our office, we have a culture of we're going to help everyone. And so that's, that's the big thing is that whatever's happening on Washington or, you know, on the news isn't what's happening in our district office or even in our community here. And so I think that that's a really important lesson that regardless of what you hear in the talking heads on TV, that we're here to help and, and genuinely want to see you have a good outcome in whatever you've come to our office for. Great. Um, and since this is the last question, we'd love to just hear um, from all of you briefly about, you know, something you wish your constituents um, knew a bit more about your job. So I can pass it on to Rick uh, Jay. Would you like to hop in here? Yeah, two things really quick. Building off of what Megan said um, is that I don't know that our constituents always know the difference between our official office and our political office. They don't realize there's the same. And there's actually a structural problem with the ethics rules that are meant to ensure that we aren't campaigning as an official office that actually make it incredibly hard to get the word out about what we do. And so that's a shame because people think we are an extension of a campaign and not um, essentially a social service, to be, to be frank, in a lot of ways. Um, the second thing is just, um, I pay my entry level caseworkers the same amount I was paid um, nearly 20 years ago to do that job. Um, because the MRA, the, the amount of money that our office is getting, uh, is receives has not gone up in, uh, or has gone up at, at, in very little increments um, for decades. And if we want talented people um, to fill these positions who aren't taking poverty wage jobs, then like we need to be willing to pay congressional staff a little more, myself excluded. I'm talking about my front, front line folks. Great, thank you, Rick. Um, and then moving on to Kathy, um, do you have anything to add here? Um, yeah, I, I would, um, I guess, echo both of the sentiments of uh, my colleagues there that um, I think those are very good points. Um, I, I think that I want people to know that we're just, we're really here to help people. And I like to describe it as, you know, we try to make government work for people and um, it's complicated there. It's hard for people to, to get through things. And I think that when people um, don't know where to turn, they should call their congressional office. Like we, we will help. And we, um, it, we're, it, we help everybody. We don't ask all we wanna know. It, you know, we usually just ask if you, you know, for your address so we can confirm that you're in your, our district. Even if you're not in our district, we're gonna find somebody to help you and we're gonna find a way to help you. And that's, I think, we don't turn people away. We, we really try to make sure that, that people are getting the assistance that they need. And, and, I, and I, we love our communities. I guess that would be the other thing I would say is, you know, we, we're, we're, we do this because we want to serve and we want to make our communities better places. And um, we really care, so. Great, thank you, Kathy. And Chris, same question to you. Um, what do you wish your constituents knew about the ins and outs of your job? Well, I certainly agree with, uh, with all of what Rick, Megan, and Kathy shared. Um, in, but I would also add, at a basic level, 
what I'm surprised about, and I, I guess I shouldn't be surprised, um, but when I go out to rotary meetings, uh, to chamber meetings, visiting different companies and interacting with, with the uh, staff or employees, I still find everywhere I go, people don't know what it is we do in our office. I think they just take it for granted that we're an extension, maybe as Rick was saying, of the political side of things. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that couldn't be further from the truth as be, has been listed. So I, I think it's important for us to never take it for granted. People know what we do. And if we have an opportunity, uh, let them know. You know, and I try to give them examples. Like if, if you are struggling with an immigration issue and things just aren't working the way you, they should work, if they aren't timely, um, or with um, Medicare, or with IRS, or with, you know, name any federal agency matter, or Veterans Affairs, just name a federal agency. If you aren't, as a constituent, as a citizen of this country, if you aren't served as you should be served, if things aren't timely, if you aren't being taken care of in a, an efficient, effective way, um, please reach out to us. That's why we're here. We should be able to break, help break log jams and get status of cases and uh, help them break that frustration cycle if they have that. And um, to me, that's the most gratifying about what we do. Just hearing back from someone, an example, I struggled for five years with the Veterans Affairs and the benefits that I deserved, but they just kept putting me into this loop. Resubmit, 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 resubmit. And just to be able to reach out to them, and, and we're not gonna change the outcome, they're responsible for that as a federal agency, but just checking sometimes can make all the difference for someone to go, oh yes, we really didn't serve this veteran as we should have here and then the veteran comes back to us with stories like my house was in foreclosure i just got a check for eighty six thousand dollars and paid off my mortgage I i'm good for the whole year when i hear something like that that we played a small part in helping that veteran out and that's just an example and i'm sure the panel the other panelists could could tell all kinds of stories and to me that just warms your heart and and just energizes you to keep doing what we do. Great, thank you so much, Chris. And, you know, finally, Rick Atkins, um, last comment from you. Um, what do you wish, you know, that your constituents knew about your job? Well, I'll be, I'll try to be very brief. We, we're the customer service arm of our congressional office. And uh, if, if, we don't, if we don't do that, if we don't do that well, then why are we here? Um, the legislative side is done in DC. We meet with the constituents on a daily basis and we do everything we can to help them. Um, I, I don't, we don't care if you are a, a Republican, Democrat, independent, libertarian, whatever other parties there may be, we're gonna help you. Uh, and, and I think that's what everyone said so far. Uh, one other thing is kind of what Megan said a minute ago, is that, um, I mean, I travel a good bit with, with some of my congressional colleagues, and um, we're one of the most conservative districts in, this, in the country. Uh, but I get along with some that are some of the most liberal districts in the country. Uh, and I don't, I don't care. I mean, we, we get along, uh, we're friends, and um, we have a great time and enjoy each other's company. And um, I think that's something that uh, the uh, the news channels don't they don't really project that they think we're all at odds with each other and want to strangle each other and that's just not the case. I mean, they may want to strangle me. I don't know, but I enjoy them. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, um, and thank you all for coming today. This was a very educational conversation, and I'm sure you know. The goal of you know your jobs is to reach people and to educate people about what it is you really do and i think this conversation was definitely really important um and i again want to thank all the panelists for coming today and also i want to thank all of the participants for attending and for sending in their questions um, 
So again, thank you all and have a wonderful rest of your day.